Thank you very much. Um, my name is Rintaro Mori. I'm the moderator for the first session today. You know, the other uh, first, I mean, this is actually the international or the global component of the building demographic days, which is really exciting part, as sort of the, uh, it's been said already. And the first session is really focused on young people's voice in the politics, which is really challenging, but a very important um, topic. Myself, I myself, I think I'm, I'm actually sort of the, uh, the pediatrician by background in Japan. So you can see that they've been fighting for sort of the, the as a guardian of the children, the young people in the most aged society in the world. So the, I think I'm enthusiastic about this actually topic myself, but I think the um, yeah, moderator is um, gonna be actually sort of, they might be quiet. But anyway, I think the, I really want to sort of the pass to the sort of the, uh, the keynote speaker. We have a sort of the, uh, the honor to, uh, to have a sort of the distinguished professor, the professor Jennifer Schubert. Um, the, she's a professor in the National Studies and Road College in the United States. She's going to actually talk about um, the, you know, the this more the academic aspect of the young people's voices, or actually sort of the older person's voices might be as well, um, in the sort of from the sort of the scientific perspective. So, um, Professor Schuber, floor is yours. Um, tell us about it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Andreas, for the invitation. I'm so pleased to join you all today and represent uh, you know, a political scientist. So that really shapes my entire approach. And I'm so fortunate for all of the work that demographers do to give me all sorts of interesting data to peel through, looking at it through a purely political lens. And um, so much of my work is focused on political institutions. So it'll be very interesting today in this discussion to talk about where institutional explanations actually fall really short in explaining what we see. So I'm saying good morning to you from Washington, DC. And while I will be very zoomed out with my talk, I will say that what I'm doing here is very zoomed in to this exact question because I'm leading a group of Rhodes College students to Washington, DC on a professional development trip which is something that I do every couple of years, but this year is even more important because they have been so impacted by the pandemic and their ability to understand how to go from college to the workforce. It's, I can see it's visible every day when we go around town and meet with different organizations and institutions and talk about resumes or informational interviews soft skills, hard skills. And so I think the topic that was chosen for this year's Berlin Demography Days certainly is a timely one because the youth are feeling this pandemic and it's such a large portion of their lives. Whereas for me, it's not a large portion of my life, unfortunately, <laughs> because I'm older, <laughs> but for them, it's the formative years and it's um, a significant portion. So I think it's really important to talk about this. Let me share my screen. And I have just a few slides that I'm gonna to use to frame the discussion, nothing uh, too complicated. Okay, so let me first offer a contrast for us. And here's a quote from um, Ellen Quintelier. Young people are less concerned with politics, less politically knowledgeable, do not participate in social or political activities, are more apathetic, and have low levels of political interest. I am sure that like me, you have heard this before. Um, and this is a very classic political disengagement paradigm. And it runs throughout the literature and it has run throughout the literature over time. <clears throat> I think that's important for us to note and I'll try to note it many times during this uh, because there can be such a tendency to focus on the youth of the day or the older persons of the day and how they are exceptional or different. But I think when we have this longer view, we see that the questions about youth political participation are perpetual. Now, here's the other side of that. We have, of course, Malala and Greta. We can know them by their first name only because they have risen to such fame worldwide and they're held up as leaders of youth political activism. And they are emblematic of the political engagement paradigm, which also exists in the literature and talks about 
um, particular figures like these two, talks about all sorts of um, forms of engagement. And I will say the tough part is there's evidence for both of these paradigms in the literature. So there's in no way are we settled that this generation of youth is different. They will be the ones to change everything. In fact, I tend to notice as an educator that every generation of youth thinks theirs is different and theirs will be the one to change things or that theirs is the one that is left behind and no one is listening to them. So I think this is where we might have an interesting discussion, particularly to think about um, is it stage of life? And, and the demographers here might want to talk about, is there something particular about youth as a stage of life where everyone has these feelings? And um, you know, how much credence do we put into those? So there is some evidence, of course, for the idea that we have some, a gerontocracy. And we know that there is some evidence, of course, for the political disengagement paradigm. So let's go through that a little bit. Uh, this is a slide from the United Nations. And I, I copied and pasted it on purpose because when, when I see that, it means to me, the United States is United States, the United Nations is taking a stance that the political disengagement paradigm is the right one and that youth are underrepresented in formal political institutions and yet they should be um, more listened to. So we know that there are lots of youth worldwide. Elected officials are far older than typically the, the average age in a country. Um, those of younger generations are underrepresented compared to their numbers in parliaments and congresses around the world. And this is seen as evidence that, you know, youth's voice are not being heard. Here's a, a table from some research um, I published uh, last year, I think. And I often look, by the way, through at, at population aging. And so um, many years ago, at Max Planck, uh, I was writing a dissertation about the only three countries in the world that had at that time hit a median age of 40, Germany, Italy, and Japan, and trying to determine if gerontocracy had started to emerge there. One of the types of evidence I looked at were things like this. Who shows up at the polls? And this is just the United States, which of course is relatively younger, median age around 38 right now, and much younger in some of these years. But you'll of course see that these 18 to 29 year olds compared, for example, to 60 plus year olds um, are far, they don't, they don't go to the polls as much. And um, we also see, of course, that they are a smaller share of the population. So uh, the concern would be, are they being, their voices being represented in politics? Pan uh, is of course another example of this, as you, as you mentioned, and I actually would love to hear from you and Taro about your perspective on Japan. And um, I remember clearly at the time that I had first started dissertation research, which with this point would be almost 20 years ago, I suppose. That is very scary. Uh, there was a lot of talk about Japan's apathetic youth. That, and that word, I think, is an important framing that puts it on the youth, right? It says they are the ones making the choice not to engage. They are disengaged. And you might think about that quote that, that opened this presentation. And so in order to get young people to engage, of course, the uh, law was floated to reduce the voting age. And that would then increase the electorate in the hopes of balancing this geron potential emerging gerontocracy. Um, and I will say all of these discussions about getting youth to vote in the context of an aging society I think they, it's important for us to recognize that they start from the assumption that the size of political groups translates to political power. But we should question that. And as a political scientist, we know that it is so much more than that. What happened in Japan when the voting age was lowered? Well, actually, some 18, the, the turnout rates for some 18 and 19 year olds were higher than for some in their 40s. So initially, we did see them show up more. Um, same questions, of course, have been asked in a f the fame, I would say the most famous gerontocracy but, and uh, lots of concern about how old politicians are. I mean, really tracing their ages and thinking about how um, 
youth are ignored in these contexts. But I will say, again, to go back to the idea that this is a question across the world, no matter age structure. Nigeria uh, drew lots of attention for its not too young to run campaign. And I, I know that it's small print, but it's important to note down there the last line, two lines here, 70% of Nigeria's population is under the age of 35. And so the concern in developing countries is that there's a disenfranchised majority. So that is actually a completely different question than the idea of the size of demographic groups translating to political power. So as a political scientist, anytime there are these discontinuities, I think it's important to say, wow, then it's not perhaps the age structure that's the most important question when we look at youth engagement. There is something about youth perhaps. Now, voting is just one type of political participation and the literature recognizes that. I am uh, disheartened perhaps to see that it is still the one with the most focus because there's so much more to talk about. Although Stuart and I are both going to talk about voting today. <laughs> so it is so important. It's because it's easy to count. I think as researchers, we need data that is the easiest data for us to get, and therefore that is the one we write about most often. I'm probably not supposed to admit that, but I think that that's the case. It is much harder for us to understand the impact of other forms of participation. So I will offer this as a call to all of us as researchers that we should try to be more creative about that. The political disengagement paradigm actually starts to show cracks when we open up how we consider youth political participation. Uh, protests, strikes, petitions, should we count online engagement as forms of political participation or is that something different? That's a question. And I think we can get even more creative. This is a, a Tunisian rapper who, and, and there, uh, France has the same um, rap culture that talks a lot about politics as well. Is, should that be counted as political participation? The same kinds of questions, as I said, are asked not just about gerontocracy in countries with older age structures, but also in countries with very young age structures. And again, I think that's interesting as a researcher. Now, we know that there's a, a burgeoning literature that's very optimistic. It's framed in a very positive way to look at the role that youth can play in building peace and conflict settings. And that's really interesting where we see a lot of, um, commonality with developed countries is this idea of the global weighthood generation. You may have heard about this. So it's the idea that in um, countries that have not yet industrialized, youth have been systematically excluded from political participation, often because their institutions don't allow them to vote or have a say in, in governance. They've been politically, I mean, they have been um, excluded from social participation because often they don't have enough money to marry. And in these society, many of these societies, marriage is an important marker of adulthood. So those structures are missing. And then of course, tied to that, they have been eco economically excluded. They might have a lot of education, but are unable to um, get employment. And so when I hear those three things, as someone who studies industrialized countries and population aging, I think it's the same concept. And this is what I think a lot of us talk about with um, worries that youth, there is something different about youth today. And so again, to go back to the data <clears throat> in the United States, for example, yes, we do see that younger people are hitting markers of uh, adult, typical markers of adulthood at much later ages than prior generations did, their wealth accumulation is far lower. In the United States, buying your own home buying is uh, seen as a, a major marker of adulthood and has been attainable for many people and is becoming unattainable. So let me give a, a global uh, comparative perspective here as well. I did some field work in Singapore many years ago and interviewed youth who were uh, participating in political parties yes, plural, in Singapore, 
and across the board, they talked about the high cost of housing and their inability to move out of their parents' homes, which then prevented them from marrying and having children. And so I think while global weighthood is a concept that originated to describe countries that have not yet industrialized, it really encapsulates what we're talking about with youth being excluded. So I end here with some questions for that we could perhaps discuss or um, that I think we should look at as researchers. This is the longest one, don't worry. We know that in some countries, and we could look here at Western Europe, for example, and the United States, let's just take those. They're more ethnically diverse. So how do we try to disentangle that as a causal factor along with generation and along with gender? Um, there are, is some political socialization research, for example, that looks at children's uh, being influenced by their mother's political participation and political party preference, for example. How do we peel all of these things apart here? In the United States, younger generations, as I said, have less wealth accumulation. Well, they are also more ethnically diverse. And in the United States, as I'm sure you all know, we have significant issues um, with race, racism. Now, what about our actual measures of power? Is it true that if we witness injustice, that means that these groups have less power? I'm sure that the immediate answer would be yes, of course, that makes total sense. But I think we have to really look at how institutions or the rules of the game, as how I like to define it, are really different in different contexts. And perhaps the the line from injustice to less power is a little bit wavy or it's not quite linear. And then of course, this is my favorite one. And this is where I think we, we look beyond voting. Do we even need youth participation to ensure youth interests are considered in policymaking? Just because the, there's different sizes of demographic groups does not of course mean that it translates immediately to political power. So, and, it, and research I had done many years ago showed that of course, older people have many interests. It is a stage of life. They have grandchildren they care about. They have children that they care about. They have neighbors that they care about. And they don't necessarily vote in their own interest only. We do know that younger people uh, have shown up to do lots of protests and climate change, for example, and have had a lot of online activity. But they have had a harder time getting their activity to translate to the broader political agenda. And I would say that's perhaps the area most ripe for research is understanding how, yes, there are different forms of engagement today than there would have been 25 years ago because technology has changed and the world has changed. But how do youth get their interests on the political agenda is a great question for us to watch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Actually, it's really, yes, I think, the, um, you know, insightful, actually, sort of the observations around this topic is very important. And I think the, um, we can probably in, I mean, deep, deepen these conversations later on with the panels. And I think I'd like to speak out of actually Japanese situations as well. But before we do so, I think um, I'd like to introduce our discussant today. Uh, the uh, the uh, sort of discussion today, uh, he's, a, he's a prof Professor Stuart Hittel Baston, my friend. Um, he's a, the, a professor in the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He's going to actually sort of the, uh, the uh, talk about or discuss um, about the points raised by Jennifer and maybe actually sort of elaborate further to feed into our project town. So may I introduce you, um, the uh, Stuart here, and the four of yours. Uh, well, um, thank you so much, uh, everybody, Rintaro, and thanks for the invitation. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's very easy to be, a, well, actually it's very difficult or very easy to be a discussant when, uh, uh, with a talk like that, because I think that, the, 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 you know, it, to set up our conversation there, um, Jen has done a really uh, fantastic job. And so I'm, I'm not, I'm really going to kind of elaborate on one or two different, uh, on one or two kind of components of this. And particularly, I think this idea of uh, voting at 16 or changing the voting age, not least because I think it chimes into this 
silver bullet idea, uh, as, you, as many, some of you may know, I primarily work on low fertility. And I think this whole discussion is, uh, has certain echoes with that, that, oh, young people are to blame. They're, they're, it's a dereliction of their duty and they're not doing what they should be doing. And in this case, not having children, not getting married, not support, you know, not you know, they're contributing to this social recession. And this idea that, well, we'll just give them a bit of cash and a tax break is going to fix everything. And I just wanted to explore the, ex the extent to which uh, changes in the franchise would, um, uh, would make a similar uh, change to for this political um, discussion. Um, to be honest, in the same way as that low fertility is the discussion around that is not that brilliant. Uh, neither is the discussion in many ways around uh, the franchise. This is the dear Richard Dawkins, um, uh, many of you may know. Um, just makes you, doesn't this headline just make your skin crawl? This is, and they wonder why, this is when, why middle-aged older men should not try to, to be cool and engage with young people, right? Because this is just it's nauseating. Unfortunately, the uh, the science behind this is wrong as well. Just the idea that that uh, if that your brain is not ready to vote at sixteen, I don't even know what that really means. But anyway, fortunately, my colleagues in neuroscience have have debunked this. Um, in um, whereas elsewhere in uh, political studies, we've seen. Um, uh, others argue that young people are to a significant degree less politically net less mature than older people and that voting should not be lowered to the age of, of 16. Well, fortunately, we're now in a position where uh, plenty of places around the world have indeed um, lowered the age of uh, legal voting down to either 16 or, or 17 or, or, or um, uh, with certain kind of caveats, certain conditions. So, for example, in Bosnia, you've got to be employed and paying tax and, and uh, fantastic in, in Indonesia. Uh, anyone below the age of eight, 17 can vote if they are married. Um, so we now have a kind of corpus of, of places around the world where we can explore this transition to lowering um, voting age. And um, uh, in fact, in uh, one of those countries is Austria. And uh, a, a paper um, more than nearly 10 years ago now from Austria, uh, more or less completely uh, debunked this idea that younger people are polit somehow politically less mature, are making uh, inappropriate or incorrect or decisions which are against their best interests from survey data called the quality of vote choice is no lower than older cohorts, which assumes that older cohorts make good quality uh, vote choices as well, which we know they don't in many cases, and that younger people are no less able or, or motivated to vote. Now, although we're, this is supposed to be the global um, part, I'm afraid I'm going to, to mention a little bit about the UK and our experiences in the, in the, in the UK, um, that although nationally um, uh, 16 and 17 year olds cannot vote in the devolved entities uh, of Scotland, Wales, and also some of the uh, dependencies, um, younger people uh, aged 16 to 17 can indeed uh, vote under the, the devolved structures. And some of you may know that in the 2014 Scottish referendum, uh, which was the first kind of major test where younger people aged 16 to 17 were allowed to vote, the turnout was extremely high. And there's a very, very high level of engagement uh, among 16 to 17 year olds. However, in the uh, Senate elections, which is like the Welsh Senate elections, uh, last year, uh, on the, almost the opposite. The, the turnout rates were low, and there was quite a high level of political uh, disengagement among 16 to 17 year olds. So this has kind of set this awkward uh, stage there for saying, well, this again is just further evidence of disengagement. But then when we actually look a little bit more closely, we can say, well, the Scottish independent referendum was a kind of a well, at the time, some people, I think the, the, the side that won thought, hoped it would be once in a lifetime. I, it's almost certainly not going to be once in a lifetime, but it's a big, uh, major big event and very clear. The 2021 Senate elections uh, were uh, in COVID times, of course, um, but then also the Welsh Senate elections compared to the, uh, the Scottish referendum is, is arguably a, a different uh, scale. Um, and indeed, there was a lot of kind of, uh, we know that a lot of uh, uncertainty around 
not just young people, but I think many people across Wales as to the, what people are actually voting for, the functions of, of devolved uh, parliaments and the function of devolved bodies uh, in the UK, which is actually very, in local government, which of course is very complicated. But in both cases, in both Wales and Scotland, we saw you know, uh, 16 to 17 year olds accessing a very wide array of information and I think that, that goes that's another uh, important aspect of this, not just participation, but you know, the idea that teenagers are, are sitting around uh, reading copies of the Daily Telegraph and, and poring over uh, uh, right wing opinion in there. And, and I, I, this is not the way you know, that, that uh, the information uh, is, of course, consumed these days. And I think that in order to, to kind of explain and expand upon this, we have to consider these political misjudgments as well you know the idea that uh, right-wing parties will never let younger people vote because younger people are all radical uh, socialists who are going to vote for the left and, and there was this view i think among many that um uh, uh, that, 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 that in the independence referendum that this was a sneaky trick by the Scottish National Party, because of course, assuming that all 16 and 17 year olds are hopelessly and wonderfully idealistic and pro-independence. Anyway, turns out this was not particularly the case. Um, it's uh, the, the, we have empirical evidence to show that this is you know, younger, 16, 17 year old voters are not no more radical than uh, older uh, voters. Um, but I think it's also, in, this is again, something that Jen mentioned as well, is this idea that older voters don't want it because they're selfish and they will be upset about having their power diluted. But there's really very little evidence uh, for this uh, selfishness among older voters. But I think, but on the, but there does seem to be, I think, more evidence that, that politicians believe it, right? That it, it, it's this, this sense that, uh, it's a kind of convenient misperception um, that uh, older people um, uh, can, you know, should be pandered to because they vote more and they, they, they have more say. And of course, the sad thing is, if we actually link this together, that leads to if once politicians are seeing older voters as fodder, this actually means that poor policy formulation, you know, and older votes are taken for granted by certain parties, that actually policy formulation for older people uh, is uh, left behind and is, is kind of weak as well. So anyway, just to kind of conclude this together, I think that we can say that there's a lot of misperceptions, but there really is a strong evidence base to justify uh, changing in the, uh, in the voting age. But we have to be clear about this. This is not a quick fix in the same way as just giving people money to have babies is not a quick fix, right? Demographically, it's really not going to make much of a difference, right? If we think in just in terms of raw ratios of comparing the kind of um, 25 plus to the 18 to 24 versus 25 plus versus 16 to 24. Um, this, this is so eight point, this N is Northern Europe, East E is Eastern Europe. So it's not really going to make an enormous amount of difference. But at the same time, it has to be kind of part of that package of measures which I think need to be brought in uh, in terms of engagement and the different types of engagement, seeing voting as just one axis of political engagement, but indeed it is a very important axis and it is one which translates much of the uh, online and offline activism into political power. And I don't think that, you know, while we shouldn't only be talking about voting, we shouldn't underestimate the power of uh, voting. Uh, in contemporary political systems. Uh, education has to be uh, cent uh, central to this. And again, in a kind of multimodal way, uh, this is one of the issues in Malta, for example, has been brought up many times. Talking new languages, um, and of course, you know, getting better policies for younger people to uh, engage with in the first place. So if, you, if, if younger people feel alienated and if, if, if policies relating to things which younger people care about are not being discussed, then just saying, okay, but you can vote, is not really gonna make uh, a lot of difference, I think. Um, it would though increase this youth population by 28% across Europe if we brought, if, if we take you know, um, 16 to 24 rather than 18 to 24. And I think it would be a clear statement of inclusion and reclassification showing that the vo that voices matter 
um, and that uh, uh, that younger people, age 16 to 17, are brought into the. Uh, but of course, it's not just about 16, 17, 16 and 17 year olds, right? It's about making politics and voting relevant for all of the population. And here we're just talking about one particular age group, but it would be about, as, as Jen mentioned, about these inequalities and injustices and, and intersectionalities, which we would see um, across the um, across the age range. So again, my own little discussion points, in addition to Jen's, I suppose, it would be interesting to hear about from uh, panelists and, and people with us today on the state of discussion on voting age um, and where this discussion of franchise uh, links in with other modes of engagement and, and, and basically seeing how voting is as being a part of the political process and not the, the beginning and the end or the and or the end point of, of political engagement. And then also something which I'm always very concerned about, which is like, how do we reach beyond those who are already engaged? You know, we, we of course, we can all name very famous people around the world who are very politically active and engaged, but what about the vast majority of people who are not uh, engaged? How can we bring uh, such uh, such people in into the uh, into the discourse? Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stuart. Another actually insightful actually comments and the discussion. So there are lots of actually discussion points actually raised um, in addition to the guiding questions that was actually proposed by the uh, conference organizers. So there are lots of questions. But I think the empty uh, Jennifer's presentation raised actually sort of the uh, the more sort of in depth actually sort of understanding of the I think the uh, the political power. But at the same time. She proposed about sort of the, the issues around diversity and the end as well among the old, um, the young people. And I think the, uh, the the voting system is actually well, it's not a discuss about the my Japanese perspective. Yes, there are the recent changes on the there was you're breaking up and we've missed um, we missed the last about two minutes party, of what you said I mean, which is they consider the young people's act. so <laughs> well that was a political motivation as well so there are lots of i think the um issues uh, behind the scenes of the you know such a the changes could be actually considered Anyway, I think the, um, the, uh, we might actually sort of be going to the sort of introduce three of uh, the, uh, the enthusiastic panelists to introduce first. So there are three. I think the um, um, sort of the, well, unfortunately, well, I think they have a bit of issues on gender actually balance, but I think they are going to sort of introduce three of people here to bring it to the panel on the floor. The first one, uh, the, uh, the Professor Dragonstein Jepvik from the University of the Bedrad. Uh, welcome to this session. And also the Mr. Muridal, the Upandyai, the, uh, the, he is actually sort of the, uh, the, the, in, the, from the United Network of Young Peaceful, Peace Builders. So the more that advocate actually side. And the third, Mr. Jens Fobem from the Volt Germany. He's from Germany. So the, very interesting, sort of the combination of the global representations. Um, they've been man dominated, but I think they will have a sort of the uh, the lots of conversations over this very important topic. So um, I think the, uh, maybe I think the uh, the will the um, well there are lots of actually sort of the questions raised, but I think they maybe actually start from the current situation or current understanding of the, each situations maybe to start with, and it may be also the comments for uh, Jennifer's and uh, the Stuart from uh, well, the, I think the uh, professor, uh, the standard uh, dragon, shall I say, shall I call you dragon? Uh, the, can I actually invite you to this sort of uh, the floor and the, uh, the share, maybe introduce yourself a little bit, and I think they might be actually share their views on the current situations, maybe also the comments for the, these two presenters. Paul is yours. Are you there? No, it seems we 
We don't have him here in the room. Maybe we lost him. Perhaps you can continue with. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's wait for him. But I think they uh, they asked another person. Um, sorry. Muridel from India. Can I actually pass that floor to you? Uh, sure, thank you so much. Uh, so I would like to share three perspectives here. Uh, one is that when we are talking about young people's role in politics, then uh, first thing we need to keep in mind is that uh, let's, let's keep actual politics uh, as a key important mechanism to engage. Uh, so it's not just about uh, strikes, it's not just about voting. Uh, I'm talking about how many decision makers. So as uh, uh, Ms. Jennifer mentioned, it's 2% uh, globally. So 2% is such a small number, uh, right? Like if I talk about my country, uh, in my country, in the lower house, we have 543 seats. Uh, so for, out of those 543 parliamentarians in the last election, uh, it was only eight people who were under 30. So that is barely uh, 0.8%, I believe. So that is a, even a smaller number uh, that, that we can see. Now, when we are talking about this, if we, if we see, okay, who is representing whom, then the people who are under 30 in my country, they are represented by one person on every uh, one, uh, sorry, uh, how should I put it? The numbers, 100 million. Yes, that's one person on 100 million young people are being represented by one, uh, um, you know, young parliamentarian at this point of time. While this number comes to only 1 million for a person above 30. So that is a huge, huge difference. Who will talk about my issues uh, when we are talking about if, if let's say, uh, you know, there is no one to actually connect with me and connect and understand the technology, understand the changes that we are going through. That's the first point. Second point is about, uh, you know, when we're talking about uh, actual politics, then politics is also about, uh, is it, this is not just about these numbers. It's also about the system uh, that is behind it. How many young people are given, uh, 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 you know, seats to fight elections? Are the elections, uh, you know, having a lot of power and money driven? basis uh, in these democratic, uh, democratic countries and how these young people can afford actually to fight those or, or stand in those elections. So those are an, another big issue. The third thing that I want to talk about and again taking reference from uh, Ms. Jennifer's presentation. So uh, it mentioned about young people's role in peace building. And that is very important because uh, peace building is not only happening at the tier one level where uh, the discussions are happening between countries, it's also happening at the grassroots level. If you talk about tier one as well, young people are not, you know, young people have a really good added advantage. We call it comparative advantage. They have access to their deep communities. And if we say that 90% of young people are coming from, uh, you know, countries affected of violence, then I think they have better reach to their peers as well. So if these are the two things that we keep into account, I think young people need to be included more in these formal negotiations. Uh, they should be on the table uh, discussing about these issues. So these are very key important things. Uh, when young people are not included in these formal avenues, it's like you need to run a marathon, but you want to run only with one leg. So we are not saying that only young people will solve everything, but when you have the potential to run by with two legs, like young people and adults together, this this specific exclusion that is being put marked due to all the misconceptions that uh, Stuart was talking about, then I think that is where the problem is happening. So, yeah, that, that's what I would like to bring to this conversation. Thank you very much, Nido. I think the, yes, I think the, uh, probably yeah, we can continue to have a discussions on the voting, but I think the, I really want to. I think the, my internet connection is actually not a problem. Um, the uh, I guess I think the, I'd like to introduce another panel member, um, Jens. Um, are you there? Uh, if you could actually sort of join the floor 
and uh, maybe actually sort of share your views. Um, might be a bit of an introduction to you, uh, yourself as well, maybe. Then we can have a sort of the uh, the sort of the uh, the more sort of integrated conversations among the, all of us, I guess. So over to you. Sure. Um, thank you. Um, and also thanks for the the presentations. Uh, yeah, I'm Jens. I'm a representative of uh, the German board of Vault Germany. So Vault Germany is a uh, yeah, one of the first European parties. So we are kind of a, a party that is connected in all over Europe. We're trying to build up um, a yeah, party across Europe that um, represents the same the same values across Europe. And yeah, I'm, I'm part of the German chapter. So uh, thanks for having me. I'm also a student of political science in Bamberg at the at the moment. So yeah, it's uh, quite, quite interesting for me as well at uh, the topic of voting rights. And um, yeah, what, what I actually wanted to add um, to what we heard earlier was um, the role of young people or especially how young people are seen in democracies, how um, we can uh, increase the participation and I think a big part of that or a big issue is how young people are actually seen within um, democracy so um, there are lots of debates um, I think uh, you Stuart you, you showed it earlier uh, con concerning uh, political misjudgments so there are a lot of a lot of debates about uh, what makes young people even even qualified for political participation they're they're seen as not mature enough and they don't have enough experience i mean obviously they have less um, age experience than than older people so i mean that's that's quite quite logical um they lack knowledge and so on so those are some some um yeah, misjudgments that are made, and for some for some reason, those are seen as reasons as to why younger people should um, not be represented as much as other generations because um, they might not be as fit um, to participate in politics. Which is, I mean, <laughs> which leads us back to to young people not being um, not not wanting to participate because I mean, obviously, so if, if that's how they are seen. Um, this will this will just give you a pretty bad atmosphere in, in politics as well. So um, I think it's something that we experience as a party. Um, always we have quite a few young people. So uh, our um, actually our, our average age is around 35. So <laughs> we're pretty young for a German party. And um, so when we are campaigning on the streets and so on, so there are lots of people telling us, well, uh, I think it's quite nice what you what you stand for, but they always kind of look down on you as, as being uh, quite naive or, um, or lacking experience and so on. And I think that's the that's the general picture that we have to change in society that we uh, acknowledge that there are other important parts. For example, the perspective that I have as a as a young person on on the world, and that there are different issues maybe that um, kind of hit me different than than other people. And and those perspective uh, perspective is um, what we really bring to the table. And that it's not all about experience. I mean, experience is definitely important, but um, that young people have a have a, a few different aspects that uh, they can provide, and that maybe other um, other parts of society can provide just as well in parliaments. Thank you very much, Jens. Now, thanks to all the speakers and panelists who sort of said what they would need to say at the beginning. So we might actually have a sort of the starting a sort of the hot conversations, I guess. I think the, we'll have a sort of the guiding questions maybe actually, but I think we don't need to stick with these guiding questions. Also, I think the, there are several questions posed by the uh, Jennifer and Stuart. So maybe it will also sort of be a good opportunity if you have in front of the questions for the audience. So the, to the audience, if you have any questions, just pose it on the sort of the Q&A. And I think the, I really want to actually sort of the promote questions and answers from the, our panels and the speakers as well. So um, the, may I seek any sort of the, uh, the questions? If not, I think the, we might ask the sort of the, uh, oh, here we go, uh, the, uh, the Nico. Um, you have your comments or question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope I'm not uh, do, uh, taking, starting, the, starting the discussion, but I, I like this very much, this idea of the extending the, the voting age to, to 16. I think it's everybody should be sympathetic to that, but there's also a risk and I don't think it's a silver bullet and it won't solve any problem because the risk there is that we're falling into a trap of, of ageism. That age is a determinant factor of your of your voting behavior, which I, I seriously doubt. And I have anecdotal evidence from the Netherlands. I'm I'm older. I'm retired. I'm definitely not voting 
for older uh, parties that we have uh, in our Dutch parliament that are focusing entirely on the interests of older people or on retirement issues. And I think that goes for a lot of other people. Jennifer mentioned it. There are parents, there are grandparents that, that care very much about the future, about the fate of their children and grandchildren. So this, this, this ageism, I think, is, uh, is, is not what we should be looking at. And I think what Stuart ended his discussion with is that we should try to make a voting relevant for all age groups. It's okay, of course, but we should look beyond age and see what really determines engagement of, of, of people in politics, like in any other parts of, of, of life, like, like gender, like education, like, like ethnicity. I think we should focus on that. And, and age is just, yeah, just an easy target because it's, it's easy to measure. But I think we should maybe try to look harder and deeper into what really determines voting behavior. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this, this is a very interesting question. I actually kind of agree with you. I mean, but at the same time, um, being a pediatrician, being looking after the kids, um, then, you know, the, how are we going to make decisions? Um, that's uh, quite tricky. Uh, I, I mean, are we actually accepting votes from the one-year-old? <laughs> That's a quite tricky question. So maybe anyway, I think the um, Jens, you have uh, your hands up. So maybe actually next, I think maybe Stuart, you, you might want to actually comment on. So Jens? Yeah, I, I also wanted to, to comment on that, if, if that's okay. Um, so um, I would definitely agree that one has to be careful and um, not to uh, fall into, not, not to view um, elderly people and younger people as like two, um, two groups that are, that are like uh, totally, um, yeah made up of the same opinion so um that's that's definitely definitely wrong i would totally agree with that um i think it's sometimes a little more about topics so for example i mean there are just topics uh, that yeah i would i would say concern younger people maybe a little more um for example climate change or uh, yeah yeah just um so there are topics that i think are more interesting at least to younger people and I think that's why we need more younger people in parliaments it's maybe not really about the opinions themselves um, I would totally agree with that so um, younger people I mean I can I can speak for Germany um, but I guess it's it's the same it's the same in other countries as well um, obviously they have quite different opinions because they're not they're not one group they're not the younger people and they uh, want, want exactly that um, but I think, um, and that's that's kind of answering the question that I think um, you, Jennifer, posed earlier about um, do younger people in parliaments, um, will they definitely rise, I think, uh, younger politics or something like that? I'm not quite sure how it, was, how it was phrased anymore, but I think it's more about the topics and I think it's more about the attention that those topics might get. We What we need to, to do is we need to get, um, we need to make younger topics more attractive um, in terms of electoral, um, in electoral terms. So um, they need to be um, worth fighting for. And um, I mean, it's kind of kind of a circle. So if we get them to be attractive, then of course, um, politics will focus more on that. And then probably younger people will participate more again. And um, this will make the topics in turn more attractive. So I, I think it's, it's a kind of kind of a circle that we that we can engage there. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, Stuart, then actually sort of the Jenny later. Stuart. Yeah, thanks. I, I'm, I, I just, yeah, I think it's interesting that, and, and, and important that, of course, we have to consider this, the nature of the political system in which we are operating in as well. I mean, but well, firstly, if we're on a global level here, let's not forget that, you know, this a fair, a few billion people around the world who don't vote um, or who are in um, what we might call kind of electoral autocracies where, you know, you, there might in theory be some democratic processes, but um, your say is, um, uh, how should we say, somewhat marginal. Um, and, you know, I think that, that that's, those groups really need to be considered in the, um, um, in the discussion as well. And what happens when those voices are uh, locked out and um, um, what well, you, you can see behind me the university that I'm in and what can happen if voices are uh, uh, locked out of the uh, of the political uh, and the social uh, discourse but anyway I'm not going to go down that uh, path here um, but I think to, and to talk uh, about what uh, Nico mentioned there I mean it's 
again, if if you have political systems where you know you have coalition governments and uh, you have a history of coalition governments and, you, and and different parties are bringing different voices in, then yeah, I mean, my instinct goes against like the fifty plus party in Holland. You know, it, it seems sad that that there is a need for a 50 plus party. But then if that is a voice within a, a coalition, then that might be slightly different. But that's actually what I wanted to ask. If I can ask Jens a question, which is, you know, like Volt has, has done extremely well, right? In the last few years, um, I would say, and, and has made breakthroughs in, in sorry, I'm, I'm physically here in Holland now. So I mean, it's made breakthroughs throughs here in, in Holland, like, both last year and this year uh, in the different elections. Um, but I mean, you know, as I understand, you know, Volt is a um, is a kind of pro-European, anti-populist, you know, progressive party. So, what what why wasn't there a home for you in existing parties? You know, what what made you step outside of of you know because you could have joined the Labour Party who are generally you know <laughs> pro-Europe and, and generally progressive and, and so on or you, you could have joined the Green Party or, you know so so what was it that that made you feel or made I know, I know you're not speaking for the entire Volt organization yet right but but what was it that made you feel that there was a need to 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 to, to, to set up this new um, movement that, that wasn't there for you, there wasn't a space for you in traditional um, parties. So it's a genuinely, that's out of genuine curiosity. I, I would answer to yeah, that. Thank you very much. Yes, please. Yeah, um, so um, actually there was the lack of um, European parties. So um, all those parties that you named, the Labour Party um, or the, the Social uh, Democrats or the uh, the Green Party or the Liberals, they were all organized nationally and they did not really think over over the borders of Germany. Mm -hmm. And what that led to was politics being designed for Germany and what is best for Germany, but um, in turn damaging um, kind of relations to other European countries and um, trying to, to get the best deal for Germany, but not for all of Europe. But I think if we want to, to step further into the future, we need to work better together across Europe, because that's the only way that we will, that we will um, actually improve and tackle um, challenges like climate change. So um, I did not see any of, of those ambitions in, in other uh, pro-European parties. I mean, they're pro-European, but I think the really important part is that our party is pan-European. So I'm um, really, really organized and working together across Europe. And that was not for only for me, but for many other people, a really important point um, in terms of events like the Brexit or the election of, of Donald Trump, um, that they kind of wanted to, to make an anti-populist um, yeah, sign and um, as well work together more across Europe instead of falling back into nationalism. Thank you very much. Um, the, maybe I said the next Jenny and, the, the, and then I think he will too. But I think that before we actually ask Jenny to take that over, um, Jens, um, the, there are actually comments on the question box and which are in the German. <laughs> I cannot actually read them. So after Jenny and the Mildo, um, Jens, if you could actually pick up on this que these questions and then maybe actually translate it into the plural, um, the after, thereafter, that'd be fantastic. So Jenny, floor to yours. Perfect. Thank you. I want to double down on the idea that it's not really age. We think we think it's age, but it really is gender and in some countries race that is of interest because so many of us, as I look at the faces here and, and know people, we study low fertility. And I think it is very hard to disentangle age and gender when it comes to low fertility. When I think, for example, about um, super low fertility societies. That is quite different than just, you know, sub replacement fertility, you know, perhaps a little bit less than two, where I would typically not be alarmist and not say, oh, this is something let's wring our hands about this. In fact, we can put a quite a positive spin on that. But when it's super low, and you start asking what, what's the difference here? A lot of the times women will say, we can't make it work. We cannot make our lives work with um, families and work, having enough money, having our voices heard, marriage is stifling. I mean, we could really peel it back. As you know, there are just 
hundreds of, of studies on this. And so I, I think I've always been skeptical of the idea that it's just age. And that is just too easy. Um, and I think it gives an excuse actually for us to pull the lens away from gender. You can run the same numbers for parliament. You can run some of the same numbers for, um, for voting although we have some very strange political behavior among women in the United States, I would say. Um, and then, so, we, so then you might ask, well, what about climate change? That's something that seems to be uh, much more of an issue of young people, unless you look at it through the lens of justice, because environmental justice shows you that in many places in the world, it is the poor and disenfranchised who are actually the ones who are most impacted by climate change far more so than just an idea of age. And so I don't have a solution for us with this, but I, I, I just wanted to kind of, I don't know if it's steering us in a different direction or opening it up, but perhaps it's not age we should be looking at at all. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I think so that I so fully agree with you. And that was actually covered by the stewards as well. We probably need to unpack that, you know, the, the kind of the categorizations of the voters or at a political system or the demo, you know, demographic system. Maybe I think, if, for example, what about sort of the people with the disabilities and that kind of stuff. But the climate change, maybe I think, that, for example, we might actually need to think, think about people living in the future, which we don't have any votes from, or, or maybe, you know, the, so uh, theoretically. So it's, it's quite complicated maybe as well, but anyway, we really need to unpack that, uh, the, uh, the categories, I think. So the, can I ask Morizel to, I mean, if you could come in to, yeah, for your sure. intervention. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I missed it. So my name is Mirul and I'm joining from India. I am a young peace builder and have been advocating through different avenues about uh, recognition, inclusion, and support for young peace builders around the world. Uh, the few points that I wanted to mention, and I'm not an expert on uh, voting age, so if it is, it should be 18 or 16, I'm not sure about it. Other people can mention it better. What I want to mention here is uh, how we understand youth. It's not very simple to just discard it as a uh, category. Uh, I think as Mr. Modi comes from UNFPA, he must be understanding it much better than us, uh, where you know, youth is considered as a transition period uh, from dependence of childhood to uh, adulthood's independence. So when it is a transition period, everyone goes through it. So there is a kind of feeling that, that people face when they are going through this transition. There is a lot of uncertainty. There is a lot of pressure on, on making decisions, making choices, political choices, social choices, all of that. And I'm talking about how ageism and age-based stereotypes and strict, uh, discrimination has been working as a systemic violence against youth when they are not engaged meaningfully in these decision-making spaces or in the politics. So, and, and this is a commonly felt need. Like uh, young people are like, Miss Jennifer, as you were mentioning, young people are understood as disengaged people or inexperienced to be able to speak about their ideas. But nobody is trying to understand that there are some underlying issues why they are not engaging. Or there are issues uh, where they, are, they have a lot of experience, much, much more experience than anyone else. So there, that experience need to be valued, that experience need to be included. And like I said previously, it's not that only the young people will solve everything. Now, now we also need to think uh, why we are talking about young people now in these kind of derogatory or you know, mistrust language, when we know that when Mahatma Gandhi, who everyone you know, uh, treats as one of the most important leader in the world, or let's say Martin, Martin uh, Luther King Jr., they were 25, 26, 22 years old when they were leading the global movements. Uh, no, so like that's very, at this point of time now, because the population or the demographic is changing, now we are saying, okay, youth, you need to come out from the uh, uh, formal politics and you need to just engage with uh, economic opportunities. And that is more of how you see young people. Do you see young people as a resource? Um, I can talk about, uh, um, my national youth policy of government of India. 
when it's a 94 page of document when you will search education in that document you will find mention of around 104 times if you will find work then you will find like around 67 times um, employment around uh, another 80 times when you will uh, look of leadership very very few times when you will you know look for peace there is zero mention in that entire document so are young people not eligible to speak about peace or engage in the spaces of peace building that is that is what i want to talk about uh, this is a systematic violence that when we are discriminating or when we are having some certain kind of age based stereotypes against youth uh, and that shouldn't happen they should be uh, you know brought together be on the table should be supported to be able to engage in the formal systems um, along with um, other age groups and gender diversity that we thank you yeah thank you very much i think so these are very good points i think the um the yes yeah, certainly the uh the what it uniqueness is in the child i mean the the young people isn't yes they are the transition it's also the that you know the independence or the gain in sort of the independence sort of the process is very individualized so very different by the individuals as well and also, the, there are lots of things we can do, but there are lots of actually uh, the debatable issues around the age of, you know, the voting kind of thing. But as, uh, as you actually mentioned, in the global context, there are obvious actually intervention we could do anyway. So um, I think that we, I'm conscious about time, but I think the, um, the sorry, I think the Jens, you have been really sorry to put you in a spot, but I think the, I um, really want to pick up on the comments uh, the, from the Catalina. Um, in the Campo Q and a bear box. And if you could actually sort of this scan them through, and I think the pausing sort of the, uh, the key questions, if there are um, to the floor, then I think the, we can sort of the, uh, the go around the table and finish it off. Is that okay, Jens? Yeah, yeah, sure. I, um, <laughs> just a second. Uh, I just need to read them first. Um, I know I can see they're, they're all in German, so. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, should I just answer or should I translate them first? You can find the translation in the chat. Ah, great. On the sort of key issues and try be, I mean, they maybe it actually answers maybe from the, from for Jenny or. Yeah, or am I still there? Uh oh, yeah, I think uh, Bintaro, uh oh, froze. Oh. So how about if you just want to yeah. have an answer? I think what so, he was saying is I perhaps if you want to have an answer and then we'll each take a minute or so or less to, to just wrap. Sorry. Oh, all right. All right. All right. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's um, I would I would definitely agree that um, that the the decline in participation is is an issue all across ages and um, all across, uh, I mean, gender and probably countries as well. Um, yeah, so I would I would agree with that. Um, it's it's an important important issue um, that also needs to be talked about. But um, yeah, since since this discussion kind of focused on on uh, younger people, that's that's why I, I brought it up so much. But yeah, that's not to say that it isn't an issue all across society. Thank you very much. Um, sorry, I think the my Danish connection is so unstable, but I think the, anyway, I think the, um, the, we should now come to the end of the session, but I think before we finish, I think that I might ask the Jenny and the Stuart to sort of the, provide us the sort of the final comments, then I think that we can wrap up. Is that okay, Jenny and the Stuart? Yeah, thank you so much. I think the question that was posed about political membership is an important one. and. Uh, as a researcher would make me wonder about political awareness. That's something that we haven't brought up as a measure in this discussion, but you know, just anecdotally, I find that people of all age groups that I interact with have a very sharp awareness of political issues today, except we have a, an information issue in the world, not just in the United States, low levels of public trust and a lot of disinformation rampant in the world. And so, uh, it only makes our studies more complicated to try to disentangle. Again, uh, people might be aware of what's happening in the world, but their bias or their type of information is, I think, different than it would have been before everything was so decentralized in terms of media and information. And so um, 
in political engagement and political participation seem to be two different things for us to pay attention to. Thank you so much. Jenny, Stuart? Yeah, thanks very much. I, I thought this was a really great discussion. And um, I think just to kind of you know, go a little bit to what Nico mentioned before in this discussion on age, of course, like whether for, for whatever demographic process we're talking about, age is, is not the primary determining factor. Right. In the same way as we talk about, we have this terrible habit of talking about aging and the age of being over 60 and, and, and we can't even define youth. And, and I think that, you know, Muradal's point about, well, what actually do, do we mean by youth? Is it an age? Is it a transitionary stage? You know, a transition to work is very different in the UK as it would be in uh, Senegal, for example. You know, so what do those things actually mean? But I do think that it's that we shouldn't. I don't know, to use the expression, kind of throw the baby out with the, with the bathwater, that we shouldn't completely ignore the fact that there are going to be cohort differences in um, use of uh, technology, of accessing information, of, um, uh, of values and of cultures and of ideologies and things which are important to different people and policies which are important uh, of, among different cohorts. So I think that we, we have to kind of consider both uh, hand in hand to say that, that I do think there is still a role for considering youth and younger people as a particular group uh, for whom we should make uh, specific uh, policy targets and, and, and interventions towards in the political engagement dialogue. Thank you very much, Stuart, and thank you, everyone. I'm really sorry that I think the um, actually sort of the four minutes are actually behind schedule. But anyway, I think the, um, that was a really actually interesting and the sort of the hot discussion we have, and a very important. We actually need to keep sort of the debate and the discussions about it as well. But anyway, I think the um, the I'm sort of the, yeah, sort of the ask the sort of the floor is back to you, Andrea and Nico, and I think they will finish this. Yeah, thanks a lot. This was really an extremely inspiring discussion, and I think we can learn a lot out of this. Um, we will now do a short break of uh, um, uh, 10 minutes and then meet again at 2.30 uh, for the next panel. But thank you so much to all of you who participated in this really inspiring uh, panel. Um, and I'm sure we will take a lot of points up which you made here uh, to encourage our young people for more politically engagement, do our best as baby boomers to make that happen. Thanks a lot.